Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this fourth day of the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy Festival of Ideas. As you can see, we are delighted to have with us this morning. My name is Danny Kwa. I'm Dean of the Lee Kuan Yew School here, and it's my great pleasure and honor to get to have all of you here and to welcome Kishore back to the school for this appearance. Kishore is somebody who really needs no introduction. Yesterday, uh, Minister Ong Yi Kong was here, and he described Kishore as one of the most famous Singaporeans on the planet. <laughs> Because Kishore's career has been stellar. I mean, among many other things he's done, he was Permanent Secretary of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. He served as Singapore's Permanent Representative to the United Nations. In that role, he was President of the UN Security Council, managing, among other nations, the United States and China. Beyond all of that, he was also founding dean of the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. Everything that we see around us today, all the wonderful stories that we've got, all the wonderful history that we have, is really due to this man. We are all eternally grateful, Kishore. Thank you so much for everything that you've done. As a philosopher, as an academic, I mean, who among us will forget the first time we picked up, can Asians think? And that from then on, the story, the intellectual story for so many of us, completely transformed. As an academic, as a philosopher, he was recently elected to the American Academy of Sciences, an honor that's rare among those who are other than hard scientists, social scientists, and even rarer for those who are not American. But many congratulations to you, Kishore, for all these successes. Among his many books, of course, beginning with Can Asians Think, we run through the Great Convergence, we run through the New Asian Hemisphere, we run through something that happened very recently, has the West lost it? I'd like to begin, Kishore, our conversation by picking up some of the threads of this narrative that you have been helping us think through about Asia yeah. for all of these decades. There's a trope, a, a, a story, a, a typical story out there now in the world that the current state of US-China relations to, to caricature has come from Yes, it was a, there was a system that America built early on. But then, beginning from at mm. least Donald Trump, America has gone rogue in that system. It has lashed out at the rest of the world. It has lashed out against China. And in the current US-China conflict, America is the aggressor. China has been going along, doing what it's set out to do, lifting poverty among its people, developing its economy, China's the good guy. So in that trope, I'd like us to explore some of the variations on that idea. What, in your view, in this run-up, was the best thing that America, instead of portraying America as the bad guy in this, mm -hmm. what's the best thing that America has done that despite the, those very good things, <laughs> it's brought us to this terrible situation? First of all, let me begin, Danny, by thanking you for that extremely generous uh, introduction and, and especially for also conveying uh, uh, Minister Ong Yi Kang's very generous uh, praise yesterday. I wrote, I sent him an email thanking him and saying, you know, I'm humbled by his very generous praise. And of course, I'm always very happy to come back uh, to the Lee Kuan Yew School. This is my second home. <laughs> Uh, in, in Singapore, and I'm actually quite amazed uh, how many people wake up on a Saturday morning. Uh, I thought there'd be just two of us <laughs> having a <laughs> private conversation. <laughs> but I'm really very happy uh, to see all of you here. And I, and I think what we'll try to do is to make it worthwhile for you to have spent, uh, you know, one hour of your Saturday morning here. So, and I think you, you started off with the right question because uh, it's, 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 it's very clear that this, the current US-China struggle has been triggered by United States and not triggered by China. I mean, China really didn't want to have this contest, but the United States uh, decided to launch it. And, but at the same time, I think we should also be fair, you're right, uh, to the United States. And, and I think if you want to be fair to the United States, you, you, you if, if you want to give one country uh, f the credit uh, for creating uh, the best 
human condition that we have ever seen in human history. Eh? Uh, it's the United States of America. Because at the end of 1945, uh, when the United States really emerged as by far the world's greatest power ever in human history with more power than the Roman Empire, for example, and with about almost 50% of the world's GNP, the United States could have behaved like all sort of hegemons and uh, pushed its weight around. And it's, it's actually an interesting fact of history that we had sort of FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, rather than Teddy Roosevelt. Mm -hmm. Because when Teddy Roosevelt was running America, America was very aggressive, you know, seizing territories, declaring wars, uh, and expanding the American empire. Whereas FDR, in some ways, sort of did the opposite and laid the foundations uh, for a kind of what I call a multilateral rules-based order. Mm -hmm. And a lot of progress uh, in the human condition, I would say from, let's say, 1945 to where we are today, is a result of that multilateral rules-based order, and it's a result of the many of the ideas that America has sprinkled around the world. So, for example, if you want to understand why China has done uh, so well uh, since Deng Xiaoping launched his uh, four modernizations programs uh, 40 years ago, is because the, the, the Chinese could, I guess, to use a technology word, could plug and play into the American system. The, the free market system, the open American markets, the rules-based order. So they were lucky that the Americans had created a system that Chinese could plug and play and, and benefit from. And as you know, in the, in the uh, early years, partly for geopolitical reasons, to balance Soviet Union, partly because you know the, uh, America's economy in PPP terms in 1980 was 10 times the size of China. You look at China, didn't see it as a threat, saw it as a little child running around, say, okay, okay, I'll help you, I'll give you all the support you need. You know? So in some ways, it was clearly America that facilitated China's rise, and also, by the way, facilitated the rise of the rest of humanity, including Southeast Asia, India, and everyone else. So I think we should certainly give America credit for that. Let me press you a bit on this because mm. while we're on momentum of playing opposite to type, uh, you know, Kishore, because you, you've been so, so, uh, so, so condemning, so, so mm. accusatory mm. of a lot of the West in, 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 in mm. a lot of your writings. Mm. Let's continue this counterintuitive trope where you mm. are defending America. Mm. I'll push you a bit on this. Um, I would add to the, the Roosevelt uh, mention mm. that you've got also Harry Truman. Hmm. who said that you know, it is our job to build an inclusive, hmm. transparent system. And before hmm. Harry Truman, Woodrow Wilson, who despite all the, the terrible things about him that as an individual that have been uncovered uh, you know, recently among, you know, among many Americans, Woodrow Wilson envisioned a world where nations would be treated the same that as citizens within a nation, that all nations would have protection under rule of law. Hmm. And, and one of the key phrases that Woodrow Wilson used in mm. this was something he called consent of the governed. Mm. And that America was going to be benevolent for many di in many different ways. But what mm. was important to him, to America and to him, was that it should attract consent of the governed mm. from those that it was benevolent hegemon over. Mm. Uh, and of course, you know, the, the way in which we've moved away from that under Trump or under more recent political American conversations, mm. is moved away from this idea that America is here to, to continue to help bring mm. people into the system. But it's moved more to, if we wanted to be positive about it, burden mm. sharing, mm. that the rest of the world is not doing enough. Mm. What credibility do you give to, how much, how much credence, how much believability do you give to this burden sharing narrative that America now tells? Well, the, um, let, me, let me begin with your first comment, uh, when you said that I've been very critical, very condemnatory of the West. Mm -hmm. there, 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 are, there are two kinds of critics that the West has. You know, there, there's, there are some critics of the West who want to try and destroy the West. Uh, I'm, I'm definitely a critic of the West, but my goal is to save the West. <laughs> so if you look at my book, Has the West Lost It? At the end of the day, I'm not trying to condemn the West, I'm trying to tell the West Please, you know, I want you to do better. I want Europe to do better. I want America to do better. But follow my 
the 3M formula, you know, yes. minimalist, multilateral, Machiavellian. But the goal of that, and, and in fact, I'm actually encouraging the West to be more Machiavellian and take better care of his own interests rather than to destroy uh, 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 its own interests. So, for example, I see uh, uh, Europe heading towards a tragedy because it's not taking care of Africa. Uh, because, you know, the, just a simple, if I was European, the only thing I worry about is that in 1950, uh, Africa's population was half of Europe. <laughs> Today, Africa's population is more than double of Europe. And by 2100, we be 10 times. So, I mean, listen, if Europe doesn't take care of Africa now, the number of Africans going to Europe will be phenomenal. You know, so, and I'm actually, and, and, and the, the shocking thing is that I warn Europe about this African exodus in my first essay called The West and the Rest, which I wrote in 1993. <laughs> okay, now that's 26 years ago. I warned them this is coming. So the goal of these warnings is to help the West, not to, un not to undermine or destroy the West in any way. And I think the world actually be better off with a, a strong United States uh, rather than uh, a weaker uh, United States. And, 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 and the United States, as you know, as we saw, you know, a few days ago, some of you were here uh, when I was having a dialogue with uh, Tom Friedman, you know. Yeah. And, you know, the United States in its own way is also a very complex uh, society. It's a mistake to think that Donald Trump, frankly, represents America. Mm -hmm. Clearly, he represents one powerful American stream, but there's also the Tom Friedman, a more liberal stream, which, which, which I, they have also made mistakes, by the way. But nonetheless, their, their goal is to try also to be as helpful uh, to the world as, as, as possible. So I think we should take advantage of that. And you know, one, you know, one, one thing I always say that, that you both Danny, you and I have benefited from the generosity of American universities. You know, uh, the, frankly, the, when 100 years from now, when the world history is written, and then people can see with a clearer perspective what is it that led to the creation of the remarkably good world we have today. I think they'll point out that the American university system was a powerful generator of both uh, uh, new ideas as well as teaching, mm -hmm. teaching all the elites of the world and so on and so forth. So there, there are very many positive things that I would say that America has done. Yeah. No, absolutely. I, th I think that, you know, we're were agreed on, on that side of the mm. university. We also agreed on a, a kind of realism about how mm. we approach the world. The nations do what they, mm. what they, they need to to advance their national self-interest. Mm. And so I want to bring the conversation from our discussion about the United States. Uh, uh, as we continue to talk more about what the good things the US mm. has done, I want to slowly bring it around to China as well, mm. to talk in, again in a counterintuitive way. Mm. Because China represented itself you know, mm. in this narrative as the innocent. It's been mm. doing what it, it needs to do to mm. advance its status as a developing nation. Mm. But just as we are, you and I have, have begun to talk about the good things America has done, I also want us to talk a little bit more about the bad things that China mm. has done. It's not entirely innocent. And this is on top of what America accuses China mm. of. But as we continue that, that conversation, you know, America's uh, story now is very different from the Roosevelt, Truman, Wilson story mm. that you and I have just described. This Trumpian story, mm. it, it's about burden sharing. It's about saying that we have done so much good for the world already mm. in the way that exactly you described. It's payback time. Mm. What is the world going to do now for us? Mm. And so do you, do you think that that narrative is the, is the right one to take forward? How would you to try and benefit the United States, perhaps advise Trump to modify that burden sharing narrative? Mm. Well, two things, uh, one about China and one about the um, uh, United States. And I, I certainly, you know, uh, I guess we'll be talking a bit about my book too. Uh, I'm publishing a book called Has China Won? It's coming out in April uh, on, on US-China relations. But I do have a whole chapter on China's biggest strategic mistake. Okay. And uh, in, in the whole chapter, it's all about how the, one of the biggest strategic mistakes China made was to alienate the American business community. Mm -hmm. Because the American business community had always been the strongest supporter 
of engagement with China. And in the past, whenever any American president tried to launch anything against China on human rights or whatever it is, the American business community would apply the brakes and say, excuse me, you're going to spoil our chances in the world's biggest market. But then for various reasons, uh, China alienated the American business community through uh, stealing intellectual property, forced technology transfers, and so on and so mm -hmm. forth. And, and clearly, China did make some mistakes, although you've got to qualify that. I, this, earlier this year, I was attending the China Development Forum in Beijing, and Larry Summers, the former president of Harvard, was speaking there. And Larry Summers said, even if China had not cheated one bit, huh? mm. Uh, the G GNP growth will only be 0.1% less. <laughs> yeah. It's not cheating that explains China's success. Yeah. It's more fundamental factors. But nonetheless, there was some cheating, there was some bullying and so on and so forth. So that was the, uh, the mistake that, uh, uh, that the Chinese yeah. made. Yeah. But uh, at the same time, uh, I think if those were the mistakes that the Chinese have made, and if the Americans wanted to correct those mistakes, mm. China is ready to cooperate. Mm. Mm. In fact, today, you know, all, great, all new economic powers on their way up steal intellectual property. Yeah. Uh, United States was a massive stealer. <laughs> Just ask the British in the late 19th century, right? How the Americans smuggle machines uh, from the British to yeah. you. So the American Industrial Revolution was also built on stone. And you know, one of the best sources for this is an American official called Robert Hormetz, uh, mm -hmm. who's now actually work. Uh, I think Assistant Secretary of State somewhere. Mm -hmm. He he actually wrote an article in the Harvard Business Review pointing out how how much America, how much intellectual property America stole. But then what, there comes a tipping point when you suddenly start producing your own intellectual property. And when you, when, when you reach the tipping point, you become a defender yeah, exactly. of intellectual property. And China now has hit that tipping point. Exactly. I mean, China today is so innovative. And there, one of the charts that I saw recently, a few days ago, if you look at the number of pa patent applications, China far exceeds the United States now yeah. in patent applications. Yeah. So China actually would be happy yeah. to have a stronger uh, IP, IP yeah. regime. So, that, that, so that, that's why the American approach clearly now when you say America has turned away from the um, Roosevelt, Truman, Wilson approach, eh? actually they should go back to that approach and try to work with China to solve these problems instead of trying to beat uh, China down. And I think the, the fundamental problem with Trump's approach, uh, and this is an insight that actually Henry Kissinger gave to me at a lunch in New York, the fundamental problem with the United States approach to China is that China, America doesn't have a strategy. It has no long-term strategy. And you know, America is taking on the biggest geopolitical contest ever in its history, right? In 250 years, this is by far the biggest challenge America has taken on. But it's doing so almost like blindfolded without thinking, hey, what are the consequences yeah. of taking on yeah. China? Yeah. You know, Kishu, of course, you know, in that story about intellectual property theft, uh, you think of the, you know, America having stolen from Britain, hmm. but Britain in turn stole from France and Germany, uh, who in turn stole from the hmm. Greeks and the Arabs and everybody else. And, and so, the Chinese, and the Chinese. And the Chinese. Uh, uh, I mean, Martin, Martin Wolf, uh, one of his latest columns said, what do you mean, paper, gunpowder, yeah, all that, exactly. all this Chinese, yeah. Chinese IP. Yeah, exactly. Now, <laughs> okay, so, so I want to press you a bit on this, because uh. this is also part of what, what the, the common Mm. Uh, ideas coming out of America now that are anti-China, mm. that China cheats, mm. uh, it, it state subsidizes hugely, mm. uh, state-owned enterprises are too predominant, technology mm. transfer was forced, intellectual property theft occurred. Mm. So, but China itself has, has a, a, in defense of all these, mm. because it says, look, it wasn't technolo forced technology transfer, it was quid pro quo in a term that Trump might recognize. Mm. No, we, we opened up our... No, Trump says there was no quid pro quo. Yeah. <laughs> in Ukraine, no yeah, quid yeah. pro quo. No, no, no. no. Not, not that, not that. <laughs> but he knows what that term means. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, but you know, in China's, view, China's narrative yeah. on this is that, look, we had large and growing markets, you wanted access, we gave you access, and in return we asked for technology. Mm. Your point about intellectual property is exactly, you know, is exactly mm, what, what yeah. China also says. Uh, China now leads the world in supercomputers, quantum computing, fintech, in green renewable energies. The idea 
that the leader in all of these technologies is still stealing intellectual property from who? Mm. The Martians? Mm. You know, it's just, it boggles the mind that this could mm. still be part of the American narrative. Mm. Mm. And actually on the, you know, state subsidy, subsidies and state-owned enterprises, that plays into what China mm. itself wants. Because mm. the, the political conversations in China mm. is about Xi Jinping trying to get traction on closing mm. this down. Mm. But I'm intrigued, you did not mention South China Sea mm. and militarization. Mm. You did not mention Xinjiang and you know, mm. China's accusation of training camps. You did not mention what the Democrats, the liberals, mm. who are no friends of Trump in America, mm. are accusing China of, that China is a revisionist power, seeking to undermine the international system, to mm. shape it into a form that suits its authoritarian purposes. Mm. So what do you make of the rest of this? Mm non-economic criticisms mm. of China. Yeah, yeah, I mean, great. I mean, I, I, the, the, I, the good news I can tell you all is that I deal with it in the book, so please buy the book. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I'll give you, I'll give you a, 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 a taste. Uh, he's, he's appetizer, me, appetizer. He's given me manuscript proof, so I'm reading the questions <laughs> and I'm asking them. <laughs> the, uh, on, on the South China Sea, you know, one of the stories I told both tell in the book and also in my heart, article. Yeah. Uh, I had lunch with um, Stapleton Roy, uh, one of the former U.S. ambassadors, actually to Singapore and to China, one of the best informed persons in China. He grew, was born in China, brought up in China, speak Mandarin, uh, now working for Kissinger in some ways. Uh, also, so he, he says that there was a meeting between uh, uh, Trump and Xi Jinping. Mm. Sorry, sorry, Obama and Xi Jinping. My apologies. Obama and Xi Jinping must have been 2015 or so. And at that meeting, uh, Xi Jinping actually offered to uh, Obama saying, you know, okay, on South China Sea, it's a concern of yours. Uh, China is prepared to abide by the code of conduct. China is prepared to conclude this, you know, this uh, 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 negotiations with ASEAN countries and also he said, and this is what he said, uh, we have no intention mm. of militarizing the islands that we have reclaimed, right? And Stapleton Roy said to me that if American diplomacy had been good, the American diplomat should have seized Xi Jinping's uh, offer mm. and said, okay, we accept your offer no more militarization of South China Sea, <coughs> which means the United States will, of course, restrain itself also on there. And Stapleton Roy said to me that instead of accepting Xi Jinping's offer, we effectively the United States rebuffed Xi's offer by stepping up naval patrols near the reclaimed islands. And the Chinese said, okay, you rebuffed my offer, I militarized her. So you know, the, 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 that you, so you have one narrative, which is the American Anglo-Saxon narrative, and then you have the other narrative. So what you will find in, in, in dealing with the United States and China, that it's never black and white. Mm. It's always shades of gray, you know? So in the same South China Sea, there are shades of gray. Uh, and in some ways, frankly, it is not in America's national interest to calm the waters on South China Sea. It's in America's national interest to roil the waters in South China Sea and create discomfort for China. So this is, this is all great power games that have been played for hundreds of years. So it's quite natural for the United States to look for opportunities to embarrass China. So that, the South China Sea is a convenient thing to use. Uh, Xinjiang, of course, is a, it's a, it's a, it's a more complicated issue. And I, uh, as actually now that I think the evidence is clear that the Chinese have detained lots of, uh, you know, uh, Uyghurs and in, in various camps and, and of course some have allowed me to go back and all that. But clearly this is what they might call um, a violation of human rights, mm -hmm. you know. And so what, what I, what I uh, ask in the book is that I say it's true that China has treated its Muslims badly right? Detaining them and all that. But let's compare the record of United States and China in dealing with innocent Muslims, okay? Which country has killed more innocent Muslims, United States or China? And the United States, just in one year, dropped 26,000 bombs 
on, in, on seven countries in 2016 while Obama was president. Now, how many innocent Muslims do you think were killed? And in, in, in fact, in my book, I have some incredibly harsh descriptions of torture, of assassinations, right? So what is worse, torture, assassinations, bombing, or internment? And so my, my, uh, my point there is both US and China have a problem in dealing with radical Islam. They should work together and compare notes and how do we deal with these issues. And I actually think it is possible to find peaceful solutions uh, to these issues, but instead of condemning each other, they should compare notes and see how we, how we, how we work together. You see? So, that, so all, everything that seems to be black and white is not so uh, black and white. And finally, in terms of the point about the Chinese want to overturn the global order, actually the Chinese, the one thing they're completely wrong on is that the Chinese don't want to overturn the current global order because they are the biggest beneficiaries by far of this current global order. Which country is growing the most in the current rules-based system? It's China. So why would China want to disrupt a system that works for it? But more, more, more importantly, and this is a very critical point that the Americans miss, uh, the Americans actually uh, like to disrupt things. The Chinese don't like disruptions. They're in their whole culture, chaos is something you fear. So you want to lean towards a system that creates order and predictability. It's part of the, like, the Chinese genetic nature. So the Chinese want to keep the rules-based order. The last thing they want is anarchy in the world. Because they know anarchy will be the biggest problem for them. So they, they'll be happy to work for rules-based order. And the, the paradox here is that and this is what future historians will be puzzled by. It is actually in now in America's national interest to strengthen the multilateral rules-based order because the biggest net you can use to capture China and hold China down is a multilateral rules-based order, which China also wants now. So this is the moment when if America was thinking long-term and strategically, it should be strengthening the multilateral rules-based order. Unfortunately, America, because it doesn't think strategically, is undermining the rules-based order, creating lots of loopholes in international law. And I grant you, every loophole in international law America creates today, China will walk through tomorrow. So it is not in America's interest to do that. So that, 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 that's a purpose of a lot of my writings to say, please, look at your own long-term interests. And fortunately, the one guy who agrees with me, who said this several times now, is Bill Clinton. Mm. And in his writings, he makes exactly the same point. America should not be undermining the rules-based yeah. order. I mean, there's a, one of the key things you drive at here is a, is a difference in, in time horizon. Mm. China is used to thinking about things in terms of centuries, millennia. America is a very young nation still and is thinking about things from this uh, round of elections to the next one, two years down the road. And that's short-termism, which we've always thought of as something that kept the American system, political system robust and vital, seems to be working against it. Now, I want to make sure that to involve the audience. So what I'd like to do is, if I, I ask the next couple of very quick questions, I would like if people want to ask questions to line up at the two standing mics, because this is to be a conversation between everyone. Uh, Kisho, the, I want to pick up on this last collection of statements about multilateralism. Mm. Because you said that you know, China's the, the nation that has benefited the most from mm. the multilateralism. And there's no question. Mm. In, in engaging with the open global trading order, it has reduced poverty dramatically, lifted mm. over 600 million Chinese out of uh, extreme poverty, it's allowed its bottom. Uh, in the bottom 50% of his income distribution to quadruple in average income, a rate of increase that's actually larger than how even America's rich are getting richer. Mm. And at this time, however, we see the opposite in the United States. In the United States, about 50% are actually declining in incomes. So for the short-termist views among American policymakers, they say, this is not a good deal mm. for us. 
Now, while, while we might, while, while sort of international liberals might like to say, yeah, but we should strive for the best system possible. The more realist among, among this group might say, we should work with the system that is available. Mm. So given the system that's available, a multilateral system that's crumbling at the edges, America being the great disruptor for reasons that we can understand, is it time for us to start thinking about a multilateralism without the United States? Um, if you want a one-word answer, no. <laughs> I think. Uh, I know why. I tell you because if the United States is not in, is, you know, this, this is a famous story. If you don't have the camel inside the tent pissing out, you have the camel outside the tent pissing in. And uh, the United States will uh, destroy any multilateral organization that goes against its interests. And already, already, by the way, it's paralyzed the World Trade yeah. Organization. Absolutely. So it's better for us to have the United States inside the World Trade Organization yeah. rather than um, uh, step outside it. Of course, it's also, it's also a fact that unfortunately, uh, the United States is also uh, sadly, uh, again, frozen or frozen the budgets, uh, disrupted the development, uh, of many multilateral organizations. But I, I, I think it's very important for us we, to also remember that at some point in time, the United States will wake up to realize that it is an experience in interest. Yeah, yeah. So what we have to do is hold together these institutions, mm -hmm. put them in a holding pattern, and make sure that WTO, for example, doesn't destroy. Mm -hmm. But keep them going until the point comes when the United States uh, turns around and realizes that it is in its interest to strengthen these institutions. Yeah. I suppose the, the question is, is America going to be an active disruptor or is it going to be satisfied with just autarky? As soon of, mm. of history, you know, we remember mm. that actually for most of America's history, mm. it's been isolationist. Mm. You know, Alexander Hamilton argued that America could not deal with the rest of the world mm. on competitive terms. Yeah. Up through the end of the Civil War, America was viewed as a laggard on mm. human rights. It was viewed as distant from the rest of the world, did not want to engage with the rest of the world. It was mercantilist, it was nationalist. Mm. It was not of the rest of the world. Mm. If we went back to type and mm. it was simply autarky, mm. why couldn't we build a multilateral system without the US? Mm. I mean, you're saying yeah. we don't want the cam camel pissing inside the tent, mm. and, and that's absolutely mm. true. But there's still you know, the, the rest of the world, including China, mm. is still a far larger grouping than the United States. So we have many camels that could mm. edge out the pissing camel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, you think that's but you know, we see the, the, you know, there are several myths about the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, and you're absolutely right. The examples you give from the 19th century, uh, there was a very strong isolationist impulse uh, in, in the United States. But one of the things I document in my book mm -hmm. is that the United States has created an industry, a whole industry involving the Pentagon, the CIA, the think tanks, the companies. And there's a very powerful vested interest that want to continue to re remain engaged with the rest of the world mm -hmm. because a lot of incomes are tied. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's, it's been called the military industrial complex. Mm -hmm. And so you know, one of the surprising things about the United States is that if the United States defense budget was decided on rational grounds, at the end of the Cold War, the US defense budget should, be cut by, should have been cut by 50%. Your competitor has gone. You know something? The U.S. defense budget the end of, since the end of the Cold War has gone up. There's no enemy, but the defense budget has gone up. Why? There's a kind of a, like a military, industrial, intellectual complex that is pushing out America's involvement, in a, in again, in a very unthinking way. Mm. So, for example, again, a future historian will see this very clearly. America... It's a country that's really geographically blessed. Mm. It has both the Atlantic and Pacific Ocean that protects it from what I call this Islamic arc mm. from Morocco to Indonesia. Mm. 
America has no direct contact with the Islamic world, but America has put its hand in the Islamic world and keeps getting stung. And he keeps wondering, why am I getting stung? Just take, take your hand out. Why, why are you? But why, why is the United States just unnecessarily getting involved in wars in the Middle East? Yeah. It, there's no national interest anymore. Yeah, yeah. And in fact, when they say they claim, America is an oil exporter, yeah. so when America pro protects sea lanes for oil, it is protecting China's economy. It doesn't make sense, but that's what it's doing. Excellent. Okay. Um, lots of issues that you've thrown out. We've got two people standing on the mics right here. Again, I encourage you, if you want to ask questions, please come to the mic. Sir, we'll begin with you. Morning. Thank you, Prof. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, my name is John Lee. Sir, the thing I, I want to ask is the US dollars as a reserve currency, the dominance position, uh, would it still stay for the next five, ten, or will it never, it will forever be there? Because, it, you know, we are see, seeing and hearing about the US debt in trillions of dollars and going up, right? And then the thing is that uh, US ally, including the EU's, the BRICS countries, are not happy with the greenback because uh, when the US applies sanction, it is through the SWIFT system, it's through the uh, payment system. So here is my question as in the greenback, as a reserve currency, will it still stay for the next five, 10 years or forever it will stay? Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. So the US dollar is world yeah. reserve currency. What are the forces and the mm. dynamics surrounding it? What is your prediction on how long it's going to yeah. remain? World reserve well, I, I, I'm very happy to inform you. I discussed that at great length in the book. <laughs> and because I, I tell you why, one of the most provocative uh, statements I make in my book is that if China is looking for America's Achilles heel, that it can pierce with a spear, it is the US dollar. And the reason being this, because the US dollar enables the American people to live beyond their means, right? I mean, it's a very simple fact, you know? So that, so when, when Chinese export, Chinese workers work very hard and export products to America, America can turn on the printing machines, print dollars and send back to China. Right? That's a great privilege. And by the way, it's a privilege of, of a country that has the reserve currency. So there, there are two paradoxical, there's a, sort of the, the paradoxical truth about the US dollar's global reserve currency is that in the near term, there is no substitute. In the long term, it will disappear, for sure. Because you can only have the global reserve currency when you are the world's biggest economy. At some point in time, China will become bigger, then you lose the global reserve currency. And so the question is, what point does that come? And one of the biggest strategic mistakes that the United States is making is that it's weaponizing the US dollar and using it against countries like Iran. And a lot of even friends of the United States, and of course the classic example is that France, Germany, and UK are working together to set up something called Instex to facilitate trade with Iran. It's not working now, it doesn't matter. The fact that even your friends are trying to undermine the US dollar as a reserve currency, that's a big danger. So it's very unwise of the United States to weaponize the US dollar. Can I add a little bit more to mm. this, to the question to you, mm. Kishore, on this? Because we've spent a great deal of this, this past time that we've gotten talking about great power, geostrategic uh, moves. This is what America is doing, this is what China is doing. On the question of the US dollar, if the US dollar remains as world reserve currency and has all the imperfections and defects that you have described and that you have mm. described as well, Kishore, on this, it's really not America's fault. It's not China's fault. It's all our fault. Mm. Because the, that the dollar remains the world reserve currency is not determined by a committee made up of the US and China, people getting together and deciding that. It's all the hundreds and millions of decisions that we as individuals, our banks, security institutions make every day in continuing to use the dollar as a contracting currency and as a, as a store of value. This one, on this one, the rest of the world actually has a huge say in how this comes out. And, and you know, the, the idea that we should hope that as China gets to be a larger economy than the US, then somehow spontaneously, we'll see a reversal of that. We know that the last time this happened, 
It took 70 years between when America overtook the UK as the largest economy mm. before pound sterling was dislodged. Mm. I don't think we want to wait 70 years this mm. time. And I think that is something that all agency does belong to all of the rest mm. of the world, all our in international institutions. Mm. Um, okay, sir, your question. Hi, <clears throat> my name is Mike Corsetti. Um, so, see if I can press it correctly. To see to this trap, overrated or underrated? Uh, well, that's a very complicated uh, question. I know, you know, Graham Allison, as you know, has written a book called Destined for War. Uh, I disagree with his final conclusion, which is that war is more likely than not between the United States and China. So I'm absolutely certain there will be no war between the United States and China because in a nuclear war, you don't have a winner and a loser. You have a loser and a loser. And in fact, uh, Japan will win, India will win, Russia will win, and the United States and China will all lose. <laughs> so there will be no nuclear war. But there's, there's also some merit in what he says, which is that if you look at the history uh, of whenever the number two great power is about to overtake the number one great power, which is what's happening today, then there's rising level of geopolitical tension. Uh, I'm hoping that we have now become more intelligent and therefore we can try to manage uh, this thing. And the goal of my book actually is to avoid both sides uh, falling into the Thucydides trap and to suggest to them uh, a way out. Because at the end of the day, I, I, in many ways, China actually doesn't want <laughs> to take on the global responsibilities that United States is, is happily undertaking. And, and the Chinese view is, if you want to go and keep the Gulf safe, please go ahead. I don't care. <laughs> you can, you, if you, you, can, you want to do it in your number one, one economy and keep on doing a number two economy, please carry on. Yeah, we, we're happy to let you carry on. So they don't want to replace the United States. So when all these uh, alarmist American statements saying that uh, China wants to dislodge America, no, it doesn't. It's quite happy. China actually just wants to take care of China. Um, and that's, that's their primary goal. They don't have a goal to try and take care of the world in the way that the Americans do. Um, I just want to um, learn your view on what will be the impact to Southeast Asia or Singapore uh, with this US-China war. Well, I think the, 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 the honest answer is that uh, Southeast Asia will be directly affected by a, a rising US-China geopolitical contest. In fact, the, the two countries that will be the most badly affected directly by the US-China contest, number one will be Australia, because Australia's defense is tied 100% to the United States, and its economy, it trades four times as much with China than it does with you. So Australia will have a very painful situation. I think Singapore will have a very painful situation also, which is why I think it was very wise of Prime Minister Lee uh, in his Shangri-La speech to come out and speak very openly and very bravely. I think uh, Prime Minister Lee was speaking for many countries in the world when he said, please, if you want to carry on with this, don't get us involved. We don't want to get involved in this uh, uh, struggle. So I think it was very good that Singapore has spoken out, but I think other countries will gradually also speak out. So we have to be very mindful in Southeast Asia that we can get affected by this US-China contest. Can I press on on this question? The, the, I mean, the, you've described this in terms of an ongoing conflict between U.S. China, uh, that there are certain issues that, that are going to hugely affect Singapore, the rest of the world, and we need to be clear-minded about this, but we don't have to get involved in things that don't affect mm. us. But one of, the imp one of the extreme implications at an end point is a bifurcation. Right? A bifurcation or a decoupling Yes, of economic system, but perhaps more important, of technological systems. Mm. 5G Huawei is just one example of that. Now, you, I know you've just come from a conversation at Huawei. Uh, perhaps you could give us some insight onto what's happening on the possibilities of bifurcation, because if the bifurcation is to occur, mm. uh, however much America says we don't want you to choose, mm. the fact is mm. everyone will have to choose. Do you go with a system? that has uh, you know, certain rules about the way data are managed, or do you go with another system where it's different rules that apply? And, mm. and by construction, those mm. two systems cannot talk to each other. Yeah. Well, you're, you're absolutely right. There are some areas where we will be forced to choose. 
and the technology area is one of them. My, my problem is that I don't quite understand this field, I'll be very honest with you. Because I've been told by the experts that uh, what is coming in the world is a digital wall, mm. right? But I don't understand what a digital wall is. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I can understand to some extent, okay, China doesn't allow uh, Google and Facebook, and so they have a different universe, and China has, you know, uh, uh, WeChat and mm. so on and so forth. Uh, but both systems can be adopted by the rest of the world, yeah. right? So you can, it's possible for a country, I'll give you a, a concrete example, uh, it's possible for a country to say, okay, I will allow Google and Facebook because I want to be linked to this American world, whatever it is, but I also allow the Chinese uh, WePay, yeah. a mobile payment system, and I think, frankly, I think the Chinese mobile payment system is about to grow global. Mm -hmm. So you will have two systems in one country, one Chinese system, one American system. So where is the digital wall? <laughs> okay, so let me, let me... I don't understand that part. Okay, so let me try and put some flesh on that in, in my interpretation. No one knows because we've yeah. never been there. But uh, what mobile phone do you carry? Is that uh, iPhone? iPhone, yeah. IPhone. Um, if you know somebody, or if you have friends who carry a Huawei mm. handset, so one scenario is that the operating system, the thing that makes the phone work, the software that mm. makes the phone work, all the apps that make the phone work, mm. if they are produced, generated, owned by, have intellectual property, owned by American creators, mm. America will only allow those to be uh, made available on a Huawei platform if you get a license, mm. if you, the creator, get a license to this. And that basically says, we will not let you do that. Mm. So no Android system on Huawei, no Windows operating system on Huawei's uh, mm. machines, no Intel semi-processors, no hardware chips that will work to make the computer run in a Huawei mm. computer. That's one scenario. That's the kind of bifurcation that is a mm. possibility. At a high level, it is that the pipes over which our data run mm. will need to be separated. Mm. Because any pipe that comes through a Chinese network, mm. according to the charge, the you know, China's National Intelligence Act mm. allows the Chinese state to go in there and grab those data. Mm. However, whoever owns those data, it doesn't matter as long as it passes through Chinese hardware. Mm. That's, the, that's sort of the, the scare scenario. Mm. America has a different scare scenario on its hardware, but let's begin with that. Suppose that that is the kind of mm. bifurcation. And then the rest of us in the world will have to say, if I buy an iPhone, I get an access to all iPhone apps. Mm. If I buy a Huawei phone, I don't get access to Google apps that are available on the Google Play Store. I only get access to Chinese or Asian mm. apps. Then buy two phones. <laughs> 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 Which some of us already have to do. <laughs> okay, uh, let's go over to you. Hi, my name is Kate. I'm an MPA student here. Um, I think my question follows on quite neatly. I'd be interested in asking about Singapore's relationship with China and whether Singapore should be closer to China and what that would look like if it was. And then, relatedly, what does Singapore have to offer to China? Why is China interested in Singapore? And, uh, and, and what would Singapore have to give up or not give up to, to endear itself to China? I mean, now that I've left the Foreign Service, uh, I left the Foreign Service in 2004, I guess I can speak more objectively. Uh, <laughs> 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 and what, you know, what I was going to say is that Singapore has always been acutely aware that as a small country, uh, it has to walk a very fine line. Uh, between great powers, and it's been a very, very, it's been sort of uh, part of the DNA of Singapore's foreign policy, going back to the first foreign minister, Rajaratnam, that I worked with in 1971, but no, from, he was foreign minister in 1965. So, uh, clearly Singapore has made mistakes, right? From time to time, we, we, you know, we are not perfect, we make mistakes, but we have actually learned from our mistakes. 
uh, quite fast. And so, for example, uh, we, are, we are now in a very fortunate position where we have good relations uh, with the United States and good relations with China. But it's going to become much harder in the years to come, much, much harder. But I, I'm reasonably confident uh, that Singapore can, can, can do it. Because uh, this, the, the good news is that I think both United States and China have a lot of trust in Singapore. They, they see Singapore as, you know, Singapore is very, if what makes Singapore unique as a country in the global system, it, it, it is the most boringly rational country in the world. <laughs> I'm serious. I'm very, very serious because you know other countries, in one way or another, are affected by emotions in their foreign policy. Singapore actually has got like zero emotion in its foreign policy. <laughs> yeah. So you know, for example, this is why Tomiko is absolutely right when he says that Singapore is the most promiscuous country when it comes to free trade agreements. We will sign a free trade agreement with any country. <laughs> Uh, if North Korea came to us, we say yes, we will sign a free trade agreement with North Korea too. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, we, do, we, do, we, are, we are very open and liberal in that sense. So, and at the end of the day, I think the uh, China, I think, is confident that Singapore will not allow itself to be used by America against China. And similarly, I think America is also very confident that. Uh, China, Singapore not allow itself to be used by China against America. I think that, that level of trust is, is very important. And so far, touch wood, we've done a, a, a very good job. But I think, the, I think most, many, many of the leaders in Singapore are aware that this is going to be very difficult. Okay? And that's why it's good that Prime Minister Lee uh, gave his statement. But I think that in the next 10 years uh, will definitely be very challenging. <coughs> Uh, for Singapore, but hopefully our track record will, will back us up and people will realize that, this, that we are trying very hard to be fair and balanced in this area. Excellent. Sir, sorry you've been waiting for so long. No. Please proceed. It's the order. Um, so you must have the best question, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm <laughs> practicing in my mind, yeah. My name is uh, Jacob. I'm currently an exchange student here, from, born in Germany, studying in Italy. Um, my question is, in one of your previous answers, you said we're basically witnessing a change of guards in the global economy. China's overtaking uh, the US right now. And with that, maybe it's inevitable, or it is inevitable, that China will take a more significant role in the rules-based uh, multilateral system. Mm. Um, my question would be just who is like, who's making more changes? So is China adjusting its role a little bit and its <laughs> approach? while assuming a higher role, or are we just going, or the rest of the world that is part of the system is going to accept China the way it is? So who, who needs to, to make more, more change there? And just to give you maybe where I'm coming from, so if I read BRI today, there's always this phrase of win-win situation like in economic terms. And I would say there is a serious mistrust in this phrase in the Western world, whether that is actually the true motivation, whether there is really win-win, or whether the BRI activities, after all, as you also said, China cares about China, so I'm feeding my own people. I still have only a GDP per capita of 10,000, so there's still a lot of room, and I'm taking care of myself first. Mm. Um, yeah, whether behind, like with this mistrust mate, that m might be there in the background, what do you think, does China need to adjust there, or are we just going to accept it because yeah. the economy, the economic power is so great? Okay, thank you. Know, sorry. Okay. So it's about well, the, uh, two things. Uh, one is about China and multilateralism, and the other is about BRI. Uh, on China and multilateralism, um, you all, this, the answer can, given to you, can be given to you with data. So you can actually go and track China's behavior in various multilateral organizations. Is it supporting them or undermining them? And by and large, China actually likes to support multilateral uh, organizations, whether it's FAO, WTO, IAEA, whatever. China is happy with this. Uh, so China's record on multilateralism is very clear, that they want to see stronger multilateral institutions because they see that it's in their interest. Now, BRI is a very interesting question because that, the BRI is a perfect example 
of why there's so much misunderstanding between the United States and China, because or sometimes something some aspect in the West and China, because you have an, a, a, a narrative on BRI that's carried in the Anglo-Saxon media. It's all negative stories, and some of the negative stories are true, by the way. You know, that China made mistakes in Sri Lanka, China made mistakes in Malaysia. These this, the negative stories are true, but then we everybody we all make mistakes, right? But you just ask yourself a very simple question. There are 193 countries in the world. 193 countries can choose whether or not to join BRI or not join BRI. If the Anglo-Saxon media is correct, that BRI is exploitative, that Chinese will steal your money, nobody will join BRI. You know how many countries have signed agreements with China on BRI? Over 125. I actually went for the last BRI uh, summit in Beijing. Everybody wants to go there. And you know what? What is, what is most shocking is that the Anglo-Saxon media is completely out of touch in that area. And I give you one shocking example. Even I was shocked. Four days ago, on Wednesday, I was speaking in a room like this, or much bigger room, sorry, there were 300 Indonesians in Jakarta. And a forum was conducted by the former Indonesian ambassador to USA, Dino Jalal. So he asked the audience, 300 were people, two sets of questions. He said, my second question is, which country will be the most important country in the world 10 years from now, United States or China? But that's my second question. First question, which is the most important country in the world today? United States or China? So I thought, I look around the room of 300, I thought maybe 50% would vote for United States, 50% would vote for China, it would be an evenly divided room. And you know, he sent me the video, so he videoed the room. Huh? Out of 300 people in the room, less than 10 Indonesians said that United States is the most important country more than half, three quarters said China is the most important country in the world today. So China is engaging the rest of the world in a substantive way that the Anglo-Saxon media doesn't understand at all. And I can tell you, I learned something very interesting last night or so. You know, when an Indonesian minister went to Washington DC, of course the Americans told the Indonesian minister, why are you doing this with China? Why are you doing this with China? Why is the Jakarta Bandung Railway being built with Chinese money? The Indonesians said to the Americans very simply, when was the last time your leader came to Jakarta? <laughs> Can we tell you how many times the Chinese have come to Jakarta? Really? So in the real world, huh, what is happening is just not captured in the Anglo-Saxon media. They don't understand it. The world has changed, turned a corner and in things like BRI and AIIB and the fact that, and this is actually, he, in the first question I mentioned it, something very significant happened one or two days ago, you know, very significant. The five BRICS countries, uh, which includes India, which is a good friend of uh, 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 America, is going to use blockchain technology to bypass the US dollar. That's a very big deal, you know. If it works, huh, the consequences will be phenomenal. Right? There are big changes happening, but I just not captured in the Anglo Saxon media. Thank you. Thank you, Shok. Sir. Hi, my name is uh, Sarabot uh, Sok. Actually, I just wanted to go back to uh, uh, Professor Danny's uh, uh, question about whether we can have a multilateral uh, organization without the U.S. Uh, I think uh, before I ask the question, I want to ha uh, 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 have one comment that uh, uh, after the world have experienced that we cannot rely on one super, you know, uh, 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 power. Then, multilateral uh, uh, organization and UN, you know, exist. 
And then, you know, when we gone through the civil war, we have the war about, you know, the ideology war. But today, the world is more complex, and the war is probably not the ideology. Uh, it's the war is about the system. It's basically, you know, like you use Android, you use, uh, uh, you know, ISO or whatever system. So uh, my question is that: Is there a, you know, third option? So whether have a super power to roll or to run the world or a multilateral? Can we have the third option that we don't need any of those? And the world can be, you know, basically have a, a, a better platform that use all of these powerful technology, all of this, uh, 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 you know, system that we have developed. Okay. And we can live, uh, is there a, a yeah. possibility okay. of Thank that? You. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, you know, for that question. We, why don't we take Actually, a quick last question so because we are they're running out of time. Together, so yeah. I know many of you have appointments to go yeah. to. Uh, thank you very okay. much. Uh, I just want to ask very quick questions. Is like, uh, do you still see like uh, in today's world, uh, is, uh, do you still see uh, any kind of strategic thinkings between the United States and China? Because like uh, in the past, since the end of the World War II, we see that uh, the very much success of the United States, especially on its foreign policy, is very much on their own strategic thinking in terms of like how they involve with mm. uh, other countries and also how they involve with China. For, for example, when we uh, look at Kissinger's era, mm. when we look at ping pong diplomacy, when we look at uh, Deng Xiaoping's era, how they deal with uh, America and how America deals with China mm. very much lies on, uh, relies on those kind of strategic thinking in terms of like diplomatic strategies. But today we see more uh, tit for tat and we see more counteractions between these two countries, do you still believe that, or do you still observe that there are uh, any kind of strategies or strategic thinkings today? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're going to have to finish up with those two questions, yeah. for sure. So. Yeah. yeah, that's right. I realize you have far exceeded the time. Sorry. Yeah. So let me, let me quickly answer. The, the first one, is there a third option? The third option is there and it's coming. The third option is that even though the there are 330 million people in the United States, there are 1.4 billion people in uh, China. That still leaves 6 billion people outside the United States and China. And the answer is what I call the 6 billion option. I think the 6 billion people will increasingly stand up and say, excuse me, you two guys, you want to fight? Go ahead. Leave us alone. We don't want to get involved in your struggle. I think that's a very strong uh, message. And, and, and I think I also, I also conclude in my book by saying, for the rest of the world sees there are more pressing challenges in the world. So for example, climate change is a very big challenge to the world. And, and I conclude my book with a rather cruel analogy by saying that if the United States and China step up their fight at this point of history, future historians will look at them like two tribes of apes fighting each other while the forest around them is burning. It doesn't make sense. So I think there'll be other forces pushing them towards a hopefully uh, a rationality. And in the case of the, 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 the strategy, uh, I think right now we are in what I, you know, these things there's a, there's a pendulum, you know, the swings. Right now, we are to, the pendulum is going towards greater confrontation between US and China. So in, the, you cannot stop the pendulum. It's just, it just going to go. And then at some point, it will stop. And then it will go backwards. And then you will see the US-China uh, tensions reduce. But it, it, is, it is like a movement, you know? So for now, in the next few years, the momentum towards rising tension between US and China, I'm sorry to inform you, cannot be stopped. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you for that, Kishore. It's, a, it's very sobering, but it's the realist type, the realist uh, take on this, on these circumstances. We've reached the end of our time, I'm afraid. I know that the energy and enthusiasm in this room from you and from this man here could keep you all going for hours still. But I'm going to have to call a stop to this. So uh, this has been an amazing conversation, Kishore. I know that we began 
supposedly talking about just the US and China, whether they were doomed to enmity, but we've covered a massive, massive landscape. Um, I want to thank you, the audience, for all the, for all the attention and the participation that you've shown in this hour. And I, it only remains for me to invite you to join me in thanking the amazing Kishore Mahathir.